Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome those who are in person, those who are virtual, uh, to our Conservation and Natural Resources Advisory Council meeting, uh, July 27th. Uh, this is, our, I believe, our second in person. Uh, we have about eight council members here uh, in person, and uh, I think we're going to have a couple joining us on the phone as well virtually. Just a couple of housekeeping items. My name is Gretchen Leslie. For the virtual folks, um, everybody else in the room knows me. Uh, but we are doing both an in-person and virtual format to accommodate our um, not only our council members, but uh, folks who like to listen in. We do have about 40 folks signed up to listen into today's meeting to hear the presentation. So, um, so that's good to, that our work is, is being broadcast out there um, across the state. So um, good news. Um, now, obviously, everybody in the room, please use your microphones when you're speaking, because that allows the virtual folks uh, to be able to hear, uh, and then turn your mic off when, when you're not uh, speaking. Um, the audience members are muted. Uh, you can certainly put some things in the chat if you have questions you can't hear. Um, just please let us know through the chat function. Uh, and uh, I just want to remind everybody, this is being recorded. Uh, so by participating, you're, you're agreeing uh, to uh, that. Recording and because there have been a number of folks who are interested in the e-bike policy, we will make this available for for people who weren't able to attend and, and can watch this on their own um, when they have the opportunity. Um, so I, I thank everybody for uh, your attendance today, and um, I want to say that you know Katrina Harris is our administrator. She's capturing the minutes, and Eric Vinch, you all know, is over. Uh, in the corner um, making all the magic happen here. So um, appreciate their assistance as always. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Gerilyn Singer to run the meeting for us. Thanks, Gerilyn. All right, Gretchen, thank you so much. Uh, and welcome, everyone. So glad you could join us here today um, for our virtual meeting and our in-person. It's so nice to see the faces around the table again. So <laughs> it'll be good to, to be with everyone today. Um, and I would like to thank council members, DC and our staff, and our audience members for joining us today. We have a full agenda. We have a lot of things to cover, a lot of things that we're going to be updated on. Our, the new budget, for one, um, the proposed e-bike policy, which just hit the streets not too long ago, um, the Bureau of State Parks Concessionaire Program, and the Bureau of Forestry strategic plan. We'll get an update from them. So we're going to try to keep things moving because we've got a lot to cover and want to make sure everyone gets to hear all of it. At this time, I would like uh, for us to go around and introduce ourselves as council members. Again, I'm Gerilyn Umstead, Chair of CONRAC. And how about if we start with you, Jerry? Good morning. And just make sure your mic's on. Yeah, I think it is. My name is Jerry Walls. And uh, I'm from the uh, Lycoming County area in Pennsylvania Wilds region. Thank you. Good. I'm a retired oh. county planner. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. I'm Sarah Hall Bagdonis here from Wayne County with the American Forest Foundation. Good morning. I'm Meredith Graham. I'm very excited. This is my first in person meeting in like two years. So I've been a voice on the phone for a while. I'm very excited to be back in Harrisburg. I live in Washington County. I'm an environmental attorney uh, by profession, but I'm currently a stay-at-home mom. We're glad to have you here. Hi, my name is Gary Cribbs. Um, from the Delaware County. And as with Meredith, this is the first time in years. So looking forward to it. Um, I'm a geologist. Good morning, my name is Rocco Al. I am from Armstrong County representing the outdoor recreation part of uh, our council. Thank you. Good morning, Bob Kirshner, uh, Conrad Vice Chair from Elk County, and uh, I'm a lifelong person involved in snowmobiling at various levels. Dave Trimpey, I'm a council member from Warren County. I'm a retired forester. And I believe joining us virtually, we have Steve. Is Steve our? Steve and Greg. Steve and Greg. Steve, are you there? Yes. Uh, yes. This is Steve Strelman. I live in Lancaster County. Okay. And Greg, are you there? 
I am uh, Goldman from Philadelphia, professor at University of Pennsylvania, former executive director of Audubon Hospital. Thank you. We're glad to have all of us here. I think we have a few more council members that might be joining us a little bit later uh, virtually that aren't here yet. So, all right, with that, I also would like to just turn over to our audience and just ask for introduction, introductions from our group that's here in our audience. Chris Baker uh, from Low County, but representing the uh, Pennsylvania State Cancer Association. John Hallis, Director for State Parks. And Jeffrey Brostrom from Bethany County. Great. And as Gretchen mentioned, we do have about, expecting about 40 participants um, online with us today. So that's we've got quite a few. We won't go through all of those names, but we have quite a few. So, okay. Well, with that, again, just welcome everyone. I am glad we're able to spend this time together and have some faces around our table again after a, a number of years. So that's great. Um, I'd like to move on to our public comment period. And as we know, our public comment period, we offer two opportunities, one in the beginning um, for people that have something that they would like to present to us that's non-agenda related. So we have that, and then in the afternoon, or in the afternoon later on the agenda, we have a second opportunity for people that have things that are specific to the agenda that they'd like to share some comments with us. So we're going to turn to that now. We do ask that people keep their comments to no more than five minutes. And we as council members are not, we don't really have the time due to our business meeting restrictions to get into a discussion, but we certainly want to listen to what the public has to tell us and share with us. And then we will as council be meeting and discussing these comments that we receive and the appropriate follow-up. So with that, I do believe we have a gentleman joining us today, Mr. Don Williams, who's an Erie resident, who would like to share some comments with us on things that are not related on, to the agenda. Mr. Williams, are you able to uh, hear yes, us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, this informational comment today. Uh, as uh, she said, I am Don Williams. I'm a resident of Erie, Pennsylvania. I'm one of the Pennsylvania field directors for the Seaplane Pilots Association, which promotes seaplane operation safety, access, and open waters. Seaplanes have uh, historically been prohibited from uh, most DCNR property, uh, the exception being Prescott State Park. And by state statute, seaplanes are permitted access to the park and can use the existing facilities. Aside from the federal and state uh, guarantees uh, that guarantee access, the Seaplane Pilots Association has proposed the following to ensure safety and appropriate accommodation among all users of the park. Uh, we propose 10 additional rules concerning operations at the park. Appropriate points of access, prohibited access points, and we have proposed the designation of a public use seaplane base to be co-located at the park marina, including a five-step development plan should increase uh, use warrant. This is a requirement in the statute of the Pennsylvania Bureau of Aviation. And the Pennsylvania Bureau of Aviation will certify the landing and takeoff areas and license the seaplane base. To meet the Pennsylvania Bureau of Aviation requirements, Association has proposed the seaplane takeoff areas outside of the park's waterways and boundaries. Did we lose them? Okay. Breaking up. I, uh, Don, you're breaking up a little bit. We're having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. 
Okay. <clears throat> I'll see what I can do here. Mm -hmm. Um, to me, the Pennsylvania Bureau of Aviation uh, Requirements. This is Daryl, and we're having yes. a little bit of difficulty hearing you. Okay, how about now? Okay, okay. Uh, now we hear you better. You That's phone? good. But before we were not, you were breaking up, and I'm okay. not sure everyone was able to understand. Okay. To meet these Pennsylvania Bureau of Aviation requirements, the Seaplane Pilots Association has proposed dedicated landing, taxi, and takeoff areas outside of the park waterway boundaries, greater than 1,000 feet from the park shoreline in Lake Erie and Prescott Bay. These operations have received approval or no objection from the FAA, the U.S. Coast Guard, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the Area Marine Security Commission, the Pennsylvania Bureau of Aviation and others. The FAA and the, the Pennsylvania Bureau of Aviation have conducted on-site surveys and approved all operational aspects. And the Pennsylvania Bureau of Aviation will license and designate the seaplane base uh, pending DCNR approval. And that's the last step that we're waiting on. We have filed a DCNR R3 environmental impact uh, statement form, which sum was submitted in February and indicated no adverse impact. For designation, the Park Marina already has Pennsylvania Bureau of Aviation hard requirements, such as a power boat, fire extinguisher, public telephone, and cell phone access. The license, a landing pattern diagram, and emergency contact list will be provided and to be posted at the marina. And the only thing the DCNR has to do is erect a windsock, and we will uh, uh, help facilitate that. Uh, so the Seaplane Pilot Association respectfully requests the Conservation National Natural Resource uh, Advisory Committee or Council to approve this development and ask the DCNR administration to expedite finalization with the Pennsylvania Bureau of Aviation and urge the Prescott State Park Administration to adopt the 10 ad additional proposed rules of operation and the access points. So I want to thank you uh, for being able to present today and, and I appreciate the, all the work that the council does. Thank you. Thank you, Don. We greatly appreciate your comments and um, I will make sure that council receives your written comments that you submitted that are very clear and succinct. Uh, and as we have our discussion following Thank you. this and if meeting, anybody has any question. does do any council members have any questions of Don at this time? Okay. And what I will do, Don, is make sure that they receive your written comments, and then we will, as a council, review this and. Uh, figure out the appropriate follow-up from our end. But again, thank you for joining us thank today. We much. appreciate it. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> okay, next on our agenda is the approval <clears throat> of our May 25th minutes. Everyone should have received the minutes by email. And at this point, I would just ask for a motion to accept the May 25th minutes. Thank you, Rocco. Thank you, Dave. Anyone opposed? All right, hearing none, we'll be good with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katrina, for doing our minutes. We appreciate it. Okay, moving on with our council report. And just to note a few things, our council members have been out and about. Um, and I just wanted to share a little bit of what some of our folks have been doing and give you a quick update. Um, Ted, I don't think he's with us yet, but Ted Theron had been to the um, Cook Forest um, 50th celebration. I'm sorry the new visitor center and state park office, sorry, and was there um, in, kind of in his backyard, so he was able to be part of that um, acknowledgement. Dave Trimpey and Bob Kirshner were able to attend the 50th anniversary celebration of Maurice Goddard State Park, and we all know Maurice Goddard. He's a um, wonderful conservationist that was trying to 
will propose the plan to have 25 miles within 25 miles of every Pennsylvanian a state park. So we're still carrying that out, and um, they were able to be there to join in that celebration. So we thank you for for doing that. Gary Cribbs is also in our e-newsletter, just as an FYI. We do a spotlight on each CONRAC member, and he is in this uh, issue, realizing that Ridley Creek State Park is one of his favorite parks and is sharing a little bit about the impact that's had on him and his family. So thank you, Gary, for stepping up and helping us out with our e-newsletter. We'll see who's going to be our next person to help out, which will be great. And Meredith Graham has been has graciously uh, helped us with starting a preliminary draft of our transition document for the next administration. And I just want to thank her very much for her time and effort in tackling that for us. And the last thing is that on our books too is our annual report. We're going to have to get started with that. So Katrina is going to start with a draft, and again, we'll be sharing that with all of our council members for response, reactions, and input from, from that end. Okay. Um, next, we have with us, Secretary Dunn is, is on a well-deserved vacation. Um, I think this is the first meeting she's ever missed. She's been at every single CONRAC member. She has impeccable attendance. But we're so glad to have John Norbeck joining us today to cover her report and budget update. And John is the Deputy Secretary for Parks and Forestry. Thank you, John. Yep. Thanks, Gerilyn. Uh, and, and welcome, folks, uh, for those that are in the room and then those that are online. Um, I, I'd like to start off by saying that, that, and I think I can speak for every person within DCNR, that we're very grateful for the work that the Council and all of our partners did over this past several years in advocating for uh, DCNR in particular, but conservation and the environment uh, more, more broadly. Um, this past, uh, the budget that was just passed is, uh, I would say, probably the best budget that DCNR has maybe ever seen, but certainly seen within the last decade or so. Um, and it really is, um, we, we owe a lot of thanks to Governor Wolf also and the legislature that actually, uh, you know, those, those folks worked, worked out all the details for this budget. And I'll, I'll give you some of the de details, but I was warned by Gretchen that uh, we have an action-packed uh, meeting, so don't go on too long, so I'll try to do that. Um, but it is pretty exciting stuff uh, for DCNR, and I think for the citizens and the visitors coming to Pennsylvania, because it is an investment in not just the present, you know, this is this year's budget, but it's also an investment in the future of conservation and recreation in Pennsylvania. Uh, and to get into some of the details, uh, to start off, probably the big headline is that DCNR has been appropriated $100 million out of the uh, American Rescue Fund, uh, ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act. Um, and that, that $100 million will be divided out. $75 million of that will go to state park and forest infrastructure, and $25 million will go to local recreation and trail projects. Um, and as you all know, DCNR, we, you know, we have a $1.4 billion uh, backlog in our infrastructure, so this is going to help out a lot in, in knocking down some of those uh, really large expensive projects such as dams and sewage treatment plants and water lines and those types of things. But we also want to uh, uh, spend part of this uh, allocation to do some very forward-looking and, and, and public-facing projects. Um, we're finalizing the list, and uh, I think uh, when folks start to see these projects roll out, they're going to be very, very pleased with uh, the progress that uh, we'll be able to make uh, in our state parks and state forests. Uh, also, in addition to that $100 million, we also appropriated $56 million for some specific things. And, and those specific things are to develop three new state parks. Now, right now, we have 121. Um, so you can do the math there. We'll go to 124, uh, and also to develop, uh, purchase and develop um, a recreation area that would be uh, mainly focused on motorized recreation. We're pretty excited about that. Um, those, 
and I'll apologize right up front to those folks that tuned in today thinking that they're going to hear us announce the three state parks today. We're not going to do that. And we'll, we'll leave that up to Secretary Dunn and, uh, and, and Governor Wolf to figure out uh, the, the exact days that those will be announced. Uh, I will say that it's going to be pretty soon. Uh, and we're getting ready to announce the, uh, the recreation here, uh, recreation area, motorized recreation area, uh, within the next couple of weeks. Um, so, so that money that will help us, it, it will go a long way in, in, in working on that, uh, that list, uh, the, back, the backlog list. However, we still need to maintain focus on uh, developing uh, some sustainable, dedicated funding to take care of infrastructure. And if you know from your house, you just don't do it once and done and fix something, there's always something else that needs to be fixed. And we, we will continue to work on that with the administration and also with the legislature and all of our partners here. Um, another a real highlight is that uh, we have been uh, given authorization to hire 31 additional employees. And if you've been around government, state government in particular, for any length of time, government is always expanding and contracting. And you know, honestly, from my perspective, that's a healthy thing. And even though sometimes those constra constra contractions hurt a little bit. Uh, but I think that during COVID uh, and added new motorized recreational opportunities, <clears throat> both the administration and the legislature saw that there's a greater demand here that could not be met with the existing resources that we had. Uh, and we, we requested some positions. So those positions, those 31 positions, most of them will be either rangers um, to deal with that public contact side or resource managers. And it can be you know, anything from a forester to a biologist to uh, uh, a geologist working on carbon capture and storage, underground storage. Uh, so we're really excited about that. Uh, it is, that's, that's a nod to the future for sure. And lastly, uh, there was, there was a newly established Clean Streams Fund in the budget, and, and this year it's $8.8 .8 .8 million that will be uh, coming to DCNR to work on um, further cleaning up Pennsylvania waterways uh, uh, through a, the Keystone uh, Tree Fund. So we're very excited about that too. Is that brief enough? <laughs> Thanks a lot, folks. Any questions? There you go. Plastics are such an important problem for our waterways. Do you have any idea on how you're specifically going to try to address waste plastics? Yeah, so I, I think waste plastics as a commonwealth is probably more in, in the realm of uh, DEP. However, within DCNR, um, in our in our state parks, and maybe they'll talk about it later when they talk about concessions, is that as we're adding or, or, or renewing concession contracts, uh, we're uh, requiring these concessionaires to reduce their plastic use. Um, we uh, are also looking at ways that we can um, uh, do compostable types of, and a lot of it is straws and, and yeah. you know, plastic foodware, those types of things. Uh, we're also working with DEP um, and looking at ways where we could possibly reuse plastics in a, in a, in a useful way. At Ridley Creek State Park, um, we, we've got an experiment going on down there uh, where we're using recycled plastic in our roadway to, to be able to, uh, to use that. And, and, part, and part of that, honestly, is, is, is looking to see if those microplastics break down uh, and, and would they go into the, into the waterway. And I'm happy to report at least the first reporting's coming out from uh, the analysis is that it's not. So it is being bound in, in, the, uh, in the asphalt. We had a discussion of this last Friday at our Pine Creek Watershed Council meeting and, and uh, one of the uh, suggestions, and it is captured in that handout that I provided, is that um, we ask DCNR to try to, as part of your uh, campground permitting process and other uh, contacts you have with uh, users, especially first-time visitors to the parks and forests, uh, to get them to understand that they need to take the plastics back out and not just leave them 
where they blow away and get uh, into the all over the place and creating a problem. And I think it's a major concern where there are high visitor use areas like along the Pine Creek Rail Trail and uh, rental uh, units in our uh, rural uh, areas. That's a great point. And, and we'll, it will continue to stress for folks to use items that can be used again and again, right? So it's not just your silverware, your straws, or yeah. it's plates and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, I was just curious, what regions are we talking about for new parks? Um, so so I think the secretary let the cat out of the bag in a, in a maybe an inky interview. Uh, uh, we're looking at the eastern side of the state, um, and, you know, our focus was in the east, uh, you know, we, we experienced high visitation in, in all of our public lands, uh, even before COVID, but during COVID in particular, the eastern part of the state where a large, a large portion of the Pennsylvania population lives uh, was just inundated with visitation. We thought that we sh to meet that demand, we should have those additional parks in, the, in that area. Okay. Thank you. Rocco? Uh, Dawn, just as... Um, a point of, I guess, clarification. I'm very happy to see that um, a great amount of funding has been given to infrastructure planning. Do we, um, as DCNR, um, I know we have several lakes. Of those lakes, how many of them are high hazard dams? How many of them have been drawn down or closed? Um, and do we have a plan on restoration of any of those lakes? Sure. Um, I, I think at, at current count, we have like 139 dams within DCNR. 42 of those are considered high hazard. And, and high hazard has nothing to do with the, the condition that the dam is in. It is, it is about if the dam fails, this is for everyone, so if the dam fails, would there be catastrophic uh, loss of life and, and, and major property damage? So we have 42 right now, and uh, actually I was talking to John Hallis, our state parks director. Uh, one of those 42, we're in the process working with DEP uh, out of Raccoon Creek to uh, reduce that dam uh, and, and take it out of that high hazard uh, category. Uh, but we do have a plan. Um, and, and of the high hazard, uh, we focus, uh, when we do all of our infrastructure money, the very top priority and using that funding is for public safety and health. So we do spend a lot of money on dams. We spend a lot of money on water water treatment plants. Thank you. Anyone else with any questions? Meredith? Uh, you mentioned 8.8 .8 million in a new clean streams fund. Generally speaking, how will DCNR use that money? Is it for riparian buffers or, or what else might be the focus of that spending? Sure. So D, uh, on the clean stream side of things, DCNR has really focused a lot of our work on, on riparian buffers. And that's not just on state park and state forest lands. That's private lands. That's other municipal lands. Um, we have a smaller program that's looking at, at working with landowners to uh, convert their turf to uh, meadows. Uh, again, try to slow down uh, stormwater runoff. Any other questions? I just have one question regarding the infrastructure. So with all of our focus being on the budget and the partners that have really come together to try to help make awareness of the infrastructure need, and, um, and granted, we did get $75 million, which is great, but we got a long way to go. <laughs> Do you feel like the doors have been open that, um, to further that discussion to find a sustainable funding source on down the road, like working with the legislature and, and all, do you see some positive things that came from all this hard work that went in? Yeah, so uh, I, I, I don't know about sustainable funding in the future, but I do think that the doors have been opened. We've had um, the secretary and all, and all of her deputies have met with a number of legislators um, uh, over the last year or so, and I think folks get it. They understand it. Um, you know, COVID has not been such a great thing, but one of the good things that came out of COVID was folks really realized 
the, the value that public lands brings to our society. And, uh, and that's I mean, legislators, uh, a, a number of them have said that to us. So I think that's probably the biggest hurdle, you know, in educating people in, in the need. And then once folks understand the need, then you gotta figure out how do, you, how do you meet that need. So I think we're in that education. I think, I think we're trending very well on uh, the dedicated fund source. I think we need to do a lot more work because it is a lot of money. Relating to that last point you made, uh, it amazes me, but it's been documented that last year, uh, outdoor recreation use and other kinds of uh, related activities in the 12 and a half county Pennsylvania Wilds region generated $1.85 billion for Pennsylvania's economy. Yeah, it, it, uh, outdoor recreation is a huge industry in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, okay, well, thank you so much, John. We appreciate you being here with us today. Yeah. All right, uh, now we're going to turn it over to Gretchen Leslie, DCNR Senior Advisor, to share with us the department report. Gretchen? Thanks, Gerilyn. Uh, as John mentioned, uh, or as Gerilyn mentioned, or both mentioned, that uh, Secretary Dunn uh, sent her regrets. Uh, she uh, really enjoys speaking to this council and hearing from you and has made it a point uh, during her tenure here to always make these meetings. But she scheduled her trip uh, to Adirondacks well in advance and, and, and did not coordinate the, the schedule as well this time. Uh, she, <laughs> I did hear from her this morning and she sends her apologies and regrets for not being here uh, and her best wishes uh, for a good meeting. So. Uh, just a reminder, the next uh, council meeting is September 28th, uh, and then we'll wrap out the year with November 16th. Uh, so please uh, mark your calendars. We'll continue in this uh, hybrid format uh, since we seem to be able to pull it off uh, in some regards. So it does allow uh, many of uh, the attendees who would have normally had to travel into Harrisburg be able to listen on the phone. So I think that's a great benefit to offering uh, this virtual format as well. Uh, some of you may have seen the publicity earlier this week that we announced some, uh, uh, our second round this year of ATV snowmobile grants. I'm sure uh, Bob was paying close attention to that release, close to uh, $1 million uh, for ATV and snowmobile facilities and trails in Pennsylvania, and that comes from the ATV management restricted account and the snowmobile management restricted account that supports the construction uh, and maintenance of ATV and snowmobile trails. So we had uh, um, uh, seven grant recipients, uh, Rock Run Recreation Area, Elk County Riders, Wales Snow Drifters, Majestic Camp and Lost Trail, Central Mountains ATV Association, uh, Potter County ATV, ATV Club, and the Marionville Trail Riders Snowmobile Club. And, and most of that went towards the purchase of the equipment. So congratulations to all those uh, organizations for their work on enhancing ATV and snowmobile um, uh, riding opportunities in Pennsylvania. As John mentioned, uh, the secretaries and deputies have been very busy since our last meeting. Uh, a lot of it has, has been going out to the parks and forests to um, point out the infrastructure needs within those facilities, and Gerilyn mentioned a couple of those, uh, that, um, and Bob uh, and Dave joining us at, at Maurice K. Goddard to celebrate the 50th anniversary, too, uh, to, um, and John Oliver joined us for that, so uh, those of you who remember John Oliver as our first secretary here at BCNR, so it was good to see him. Uh, we also dedicated a new pool complex and new solar arrays at Ryerson Station State Park, which is the reimagination of that park since the dam was breached uh, back in the early 2000s, I think it's been, uh, and uh, kind of rebuilding that park and making it a new destination. It's really a wonderful facility. If any of you have a chance to make it to the corner, western corner of the state, you know, maybe Meredith is the, the closest to that, um, but it's a super neat pool, and the uh, solar arrays are uh, um, interesting. It's a parking solar array, so it's providing shade for the vehicles, um, but then obviously it's, it's taken to park in at zero. Um, so uh, part of our sustainability initiative to um, develop green infrastructure in our parks to take them off um, uh, the 
grid. So uh, those events have been great, uh, and uh, there will be more, uh, as John alluded to, upcoming. Uh, August 12th will be uh, the announcement of the new um, motorized recreation area, so I'll provide details on that as soon as we get them uh, to you all. Uh, we'll also be holding events to celebrate the infrastructure investments that were uh, passed in this latest budget. Uh, you also will get invites to them and hope you can join us for that since many of you joined us on the, um, the early swing on the infrastructure needs tour. And then uh, this, probably this fall we'll be announcing uh, the new state parks into the system. So um, really exciting news for DCNR and the, the influx of money and personnel that we're receiving. Uh, a tremendous opportunity for us, for outdoor recreation, and for the citizens of Pennsylvania. So uh, with that, Sherilyn, I'll open it up for any questions you may have of me. Okay. Any questions for Gretchen? No. I think that was pretty clear. Okay. All right. Thank you, Gretchen. Appreciate it. Next on our agenda, uh, we have our legislative report with Eric Nelson, Director of Legislative Affairs. Are you with us, Eric? Okay. I don't know that he's with us at the moment, so we may need to circle back for that one. Okay. Uh, next, our council business, and actually we have nothing to report, nothing that needs to be ratified or any kind of business at this point, so that's, that's good. <laughs> We've done a lot and got it taken care of, so um, nothing from that end. And at this time, I think... I'd like to uh, turn it over to Nicole Faraguna, the DCNR Policy Director, who's going to share with us the e-bike policy that has recently come out, the draft proposal of that, and um, hear what she has to say. And so, so thankful that you could join us today, Nicole. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for the um, the opportunity to to speak to you all. This is a policy that is. Uh, long in the <laughs> in the making, and so I, I do want to state just up front, and I want to see if my handy dandy little thing works. Oh, it does. Cool. Okay, sorry. Um, I do want to state uh, up front that you know this is really um, due to Secretary Dunn's leadership. Uh, she really envisions recreation for all in all we do, and this policy is really. Um, helping to implement that vision. Um, so I wanted to first start out with a little bit of background. So we really looked at this policy uh, in terms of how uh, e-bikes or pedicycles with electric assist are defined in the vehicle code. That's kind of our starting point. And the as you can see, um, a pedicycle is defined as a, a, a pedicycle as a, a vehicle propels, propelled solely by human power or a pedicycle with electric assist. And then it goes on to further define a pedicycle with electric assist as a device with specific specifications. So not weighing more than 100 pounds, not having a motor um, more powerful than 750 watts, having uh, fully operable pedals, and not being able to go beyond 20 miles per hour with the assistance of the motor. Uh, it also has some age uh, requirements, so anyone under 16 cannot operate an, uh, an e-bike. Um, and then, of course, there's also um, some, some parameters in regards to how pedicycles, um, e-bikes, or, or traditional bikes are operated on the, on the roads, um, providing basically the same rights and responsibilities as vehicles with some limitations. I also wanted to address classifications because this is something that we hear a lot about when we talk about e-bikes. Uh, so there traditionally are three classifications and they're um, defined here. These are pr uh, pretty much the traditional definitions that you'll find um, when looking at e-bikes. And these have been established through the industry and here in Pennsylvania, we don't have them in place. They're not codified. Uh, there was legislation introduced a few years ago. Um, DCNR and PennDOT were certainly supportive of this legislation, but it, it didn't go anywhere. Uh, 26 states 
or possibly more by now, um, have adopted uh, these, these classifications in, through legislation uh, or regulation. And you also have um, the recent infrastructure bill actually uh, codified uh, these classifications as well at the federal level. So we originally were starting to look at classifications as a way to kind of manage e-bikes um, on DCNR land. But the problem is that the industry is perpetually evolving. And so one of the issues with classifications is that you have devices or, or bikes that are, are uh, manufactured across classifications. So that may mean you have an e-bike that is both a class two and a class three. It has the same kind of specifications of two different classes. You also have conversion kits. So you have the ability to change either a traditional bike into some classification, some uh, e-bike classification, or you have the ability to change a classification of, of one bike to, into another classification. Um, and so because we don't have the classifications here in Pennsylvania codified, it, it's not regulated, there's no labeling requirements, and so it makes it really challenging us for us, uh, really anyone, to understand, well, what, what is the specific classification? Um, so it does make it challenging to regulate and, of course, enforce in the end. I, I also want to stress, because there is, there is certainly um, different uh, points of view when it comes to how you might define an, an e-bike. And so DCNR really squarely considers e-bikes human-powered devices. To, to be what? I'm sorry? The last phrase, I didn't hear you. Oh, human-powered. Oh. So yes, they, they may have a motor functionality, but you really need to pedal in order for the, the e-bike to get you anywhere. Uh, so they are more closely aligned with traditional bikes than motorized vehicles. This is particularly important when it comes to uh, uh, non-motorized trails um, because we want to make sure that we are uh, keeping and maintaining the integrity of non-motorized trails. Um, we recognize that, you know, I think some of the, the perception around e-bikes is speed and concerns of speed, and, and certainly that's, that is a concern. Um, but we also recognize that depending on user capability, traditional bikes can also uh, exceed um, pretty high speeds as well. So we want to, we're really looking at this from a safety perspective um, uh, throughout the process. So why an e-bike policy, why now? I mentioned kind of this overall recreation for all, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, but, you know, certainly DCNR is seen as a leader um, from a, a land uh, management perspective, from an outdoor recreation perspective, from a trail management perspective. We were approached a few years ago from the, by the Pennsylvania Trails Advisory uh, Committee as well as the Pedicycle um, and Pedestrian um, Advisory Committee through PennDOT asking for guidance. And it's been, um, it's been a process. Um, really educating ourselves around e-bikes um, because, again, there's so many inconsistencies across the state, particularly from a regulatory perspective. And even at the federal level, you'll see agencies approaching e-bikes very differently. So uh, we wanted to really put a lot of thought into this. Uh, we also had trail managers um, reaching out to us, uh, give, asking, asking for guidance. And we, we also had, you know, we have individuals who are interested, to their credit, they want to purchase an e-bike and they want to know whether they can ride it legally on DCNR land. And so there's a lot of uh, confusion from a consumer perspective as well. Recreation for All certainly is, again, a highlight of, of this policy. Uh, we see this as an opportunity for more people to access more public land. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, we, we've talked to uh, different stakeholder groups people with injuries, people with disabilities, uh, see e-bikes as an opportunity to increase or Im uh, improve their opportunities for biking. Older uh, uh, Pennsylvanians, and this includes uh, myself and others in my, uh, in my uh, uh, age group, I, I know a lot of my friends who have started to purchase e-bikes because they just see them as an opportunity uh, to get up that, that hill or to, to extend their rides. 
Uh, so it's, it's something that more and more people are really turning to. We also know that there are people who may turn to e-bikes for commuting or running errands in their community. And you know, these are people who may want to just reduce their carbon footprint. And they see e-bikes as a form of transportation. And in a lot of cases, that same e-bike may qualify um, to, to ride on our, our trails and on our lands. There is a growing community, as you're probably aware. Uh, the industry is growing. Sales are increasing. Um, I'll just note that you know, the, the, the e-bike retail market tripled over the past three years. Uh, so that you're seeing numbers um, increasing uh, pretty significantly from year to year uh, in, here in the U.S. in terms of sales. And also, the prices are starting to decrease, too. So that's something that will also likely determine how, um, how more prominent e-bikes are on our trails. In fact, um, one data point shows that as as traditional bike prices are decrease or increasing rather from year to year, there was actually a decrease in the price of e-bikes uh, between 2021 and 2019. So just to give you an overview of the draft policy, um, and before I do, um, drum roll, I know, um, we did a lot of research as I mentioned. We talked to a lot of people, a lot of different stakeholders. Um, certainly land managers um, at the federal level uh, had conversations with National Park Service, with the U.S. Forest Service, a number of states, um, the, their DCNRs who have implemented similar policies. Uh, we talked to uh, certainly local and county uh, land managers here in Pennsylvania and beyond. We talked to a lot of different stakeholders in terms of user groups, advocacy groups, uh, trail manager groups. And uh, certainly within our bureaus, we had very, um, some really good conversations. And we also did policy and regulation review from across the state just to, to understand what is being implemented um, and, and how it's being implemented. And so the overall policy recommendation here is that DCNR will manage e-bikes just as we manage bikes with that qualifier. So e-bikes that are as defined by the PA Vehicle Code. So what does that mean? And it goes back to that original definition in the Vehicle Code. So we're talking about uh, e-bikes that weigh no more than 100 pounds, uh, do not exceed 20 miles per hour using the motor assist, uh, do not exceed 750 watts in terms of its, its motor, and are equipped with fully functional operable pedals. We also go a little bit further um, in terms of um, recommendations for parks and forests. So again, you know, we, we allow where human-powered uh, bikes are allowed. Permitted on public use roads generally, um, there may be occasions where we decide that a portion of a road uh, may be off limits, but it will generally be off limits to all biking. Uh, on non-motorized trails, we have a provision in the policy that states that users cannot use the motor function uh, for extended periods of time. And the reason that's important is because, again, we want to preserve the integrity of non-motorized trails. We want to ensure that the technology that exists today and the, and the technology as it evolves into the future um, is, is really um, being regulated in a sense that we are preserving human-powered devices on our non-motorized trails. This does not uh, include mobility devices, we have a separate policy for that, um, but specific to e-bikes um, on our non-motorized trails. Again, uh, trails uh, operators not exceeding 20 miles per hour with assistance from the motor. Um, there are certainly trails where that's way, way more uh, speed than is safe. You know, our, our, um, our rangers will be looking at, again, uh, seeking safe conditions on our trails. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that too. And we may exclude trails or portions of trails if we deem it necessary, whether there may be user conflicts, where there may be concerns in, re in regards to resource protection um, or other operational considerations. So as I just mentioned, there may be opportunities. Part of this is really evaluating. So 
uh, we, we have a policy in place, we see what that means um, in terms of, of increased use. One of the good um, outcomes of this policy is that it allows for dispersed use. So you don't have um, certain trails that may see excessive use. We may see that just because they're popular trails, um, they're just currently popular trails. And those are the trails that we'll be taking a closer look at just to kind of understand, again, impacts to the resource, impacts to other users, uh, et cetera. Um, and it's also important to note that there are such things as unclassified e-bikes, e-bikes that go beyond um, how we define an e-bike here in Pennsylvania in terms of our vehicle code. And they wouldn't be permitted on our trails. Um, so just to make sure we point that out. There are areas on DC in our lands where biking is currently restricted. Uh, that includes our nat nat uh, natural areas, um, our areas that are blazed specifically for hiking, um, and then there may be trails specifically marked close to biking as well. As, as I mentioned earlier, it's, this is really, um, this is setting expectations, um, really trying to um, focus on behavior, not device. And this requires a lot of education. Uh, so we are um, we've been building out uh, materials and communication materials uh, that we will provide our uh, staff, our on the ground staff. Uh, but the idea really is to inform and educate the public on what is what the expectations are in terms of how e-bikes can be operated on, on DC and our land. Uh, so uh, we certainly the rangers can cite. Uh, users for unsafe conditions, um, that's something that they currently do now. Uh, so, but we're hoping, again, to provide consistency across the, the Commonwealth, across the DC and our lands, um, and also um, just let people know exactly, you know, what, what the expectations are in terms of e-bike use. So, as you know, we released a, a, a press release um, yesterday, or Monday, um, which release the actual policy language. It's on DCNR's website, so you can, you can review that. Um, you know, in developing the draft policy, as I mentioned, we went through a lot of, we had a lot of conversations, we did a lot of research. Uh, so now we're at the stage of presenting to CONRAC, um, releasing the draft policy and the FAQs for review, um, and the comment period ends August 31st. Uh, so once we review the comments, uh, we'll take those into consideration. Uh, we may take cer make certain tweaks if necessary, um, and then we will have the, se the secretary will sign, um, and the policy will basically become uh, become uh, effective uh, upon signature. And I will also note that um, we, we did put this on Facebook and our other social media. But if you want to submit comments officially. Um, you'll want to submit it to this email address, which was posted on the um, on Facebook and on the website as well. And that is all I have. I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for Nicole? Thank you, Nicole. Appreciate. Yes. Rocket? Um Nicole, I may have missed it, but um, is there a required registration for e-bikes being if they are motorized, I would think that, um, is there a registration for them? There is not. So uh, a, pet, a pedicycle with electric assist or an e-bike is considered a pedicycle uh, under the vehicle code. There is no required registration or, or licensing requirements. Uh, now you will see something in the vehicle code called a motorized pedicycle. That is not an e-bike. That is a, a, a device that um, is more powerful um, in terms of either Talking wattage like or a dirt horsepower. Bike. Right, and those, those do require licensing and registration. Well, my question then comes to, could there be some kind of registration uh, to provide funding for um, trail maintenance, et cetera? Um, it seems to me that that would be pretty reasonable to do. And the other question I had, I noticed that the definition of a pedicycle is a wheel with no more than an 11 inch diameter. Yeah. I don't know that, I mean, that's awful small. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about a wheel that wide. Yeah. 
I don't know what ha um, determined that minimal uh, specification. Yeah, but that, most of your pe most yeah. of your uh, e-bikes are oh sure twenty inch or higher. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, should that be erased or? So, I mean, if you, when you read that, you think I'm not buying that. That's yeah. I'm just a thought, but I was more concerned over trying to find funding for trail maintenance. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, it's something it is a good that, point. Yeah, it's something that we've, um, you know, certainly as you know, John mentioned, we are always looking at uh, opportunities for sustainable. Well, and, and sustainable it's a new funding. entity, and I would think if we want some control of the amount of bikes that are out there or whatever, that some kind of registration be there for use on state properties. Right. I mean, if it's a private land use, the guy wants to use it to run around his farm, so be it. Mm -hmm. But if he's going to utilize some of our trails, I think that some fee ought to be in, incurred in that, and registration preferably because you can track them. Right. Yeah, I, I, I certainly think we can um, look at w if there's other states that have um, implemented similar models. You know, again, we're looking at managing e-bikes the same as bikes. So whatever we do for e-bikes, we'd want to do for bikes as well um, because mm. we're looking at very similar impact. I think the, the, the biggest impact from this policy may be additional users because we're creating more access and more opportunity. So that's just something to think about. Yeah, but I, when you say you want to register all bikes under the same thing, I... Well, I didn't quite say little, that, but... <laughs> that gets a little yeah. fuzzy because I don't yeah. know that you're going to be able to do that. Exactly. But so that's with why the fact that they're powered, that's the important word. That's a critical word. Right. If they're powered, they should be registered much like an ATV, a snowmobile, or anything else that we use motorized-wise. Right. Again, there are d different um, different camps of thinking in terms of how you define an e-bike. Some will clearly state it's it's non-motorized because it really does rel rely on human powered, and that's kind of the that's the camp where DCNR currently stands because we do uh, the way that the definition exists within the vehicle code, it is considered a pedicycle. Um, so, but there are certainly those who would consider it a motorized device. Go ahead, Thank Jerry. you. Go ahead. This discussion uh, was quite a, 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 an active discussion last Friday at our Pine Creek Watershed Council meeting because uh, users of the Pine Creek Rail Trail uh, are very concerned about the fast moving e bikes uh, going past either regular cyclists or walkers and scaring them and causing accidents um, and it uh, I think speed on certain kinds of trails perhaps warrants a little bit further uh, consideration. Yes, and as a frequent user of the Pine Creek Rail Trail, I certainly um, understand that. Um, I, we, we walk with our, our little dogs very often, and I, I've seen e-bikes on the trail, um, not necessarily at excessive speeds, but I can understand the, 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 the potential concern and risk. Uh, we've been having some conversations, uh, particularly with um, rail trail uh, managers, knowing um, that this does present some, some concerns from a speed uh, perspective. Um, are there opportunities, for example, to um, implement traffic calming, you know, particularly at trailheads or where you have users coming on and off frequently? So I think these are really important conversations and things that we need to, to, to talk through and think through um, and, you know, establish best practices in terms of how, how we manage e-bikes on our trails. Did, Nicole, did you get a copy of the what I brought from the Pine Creek Watershed Council? I don't think I did. I would love one, though. Okay. What? I'll make sure she does. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Bob? Uh, this may be getting the cart ahead of the horse, but uh, have we? is there any guidance coming from the Federal Highway Administration as far as how this impacts the recreational trail program and what because of the percentage breakdown as to how that money is to be used. 
Yeah, I know that they are actually working on some research. In fact, um, Nathan Regner um, on our staff has been involved in some of the studies, um, some of the literature review, just in terms of um, impact, because that's kind of part of the, the issue. There's not a whole lot of data out there. Um, but there's one study out in Oregon that, that kind of helps us um, evaluate the impact of e-bikes uh, versus traditional bikes, but not a whole lot of data. Uh, so that's one thing that I, I know that they're, they're, uh, they're looking at. And I know that there are also um, some tweaks that might have, have to occur in terms of how the funding is used, knowing that Class 3 bikes um, are, are not allowed on certain trails um, using certain federal dollars. So those are, those are um, certain aspects that I – there's conversations happening, but that's probably above my, my pay, pay grade at the moment. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's a great question, though. Thank you. Sarah? Thanks, Nicole, for your presentation. I learned a lot. Um, I just had a kind of a follow-up on the speed question. You said there that um, you can't use a motor for extended periods of time. Is there like a definition on that or guidance? Yes, that's a, that's a really good question. And there, it, the, the idea is, again, trying to set expectations for users that when you come onto a non-motorized trail, that the idea is you're using human power, um, pedal assist. So we recognize that, you know, that motor function may certainly be helpful. You know, we're not going to have rangers on trails pulling people over. Um, but, again, just we want to clearly set the expectation of what we consider a non-motorized trail. Um, mm -hmm. So it's hard to enforce. Um, so it's more about education. Thank you. And I'm not super familiar with e-bikes, but is there any consideration of, like, sound impacting wildlife or, you know, ecosystems and that kind of stuff. I don't, I'm not sure how wild these bikes are. They're not, they can barely hear them. Yeah, they're, they're, which, you know, um, means that they can have similar impacts to traditional bikes and as well. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, they tend to be pretty quiet. Okay. Um, Thank but, you. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, there, there's certainly a concern about access to areas. So we have natural areas, obviously, that are off limit to bikes for a reason because we're protecting sensitive habitat areas, et cetera. So, you know, this, uh, creating more opportunity for access is, is good in terms of recreational for all, but we also have to be cautious about what the potential impact might be on, on habitat. And so that's something we need to think about very carefully as well. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Dave? Uh, just, just a few thoughts as I've heard in the conversation, but <clears throat> I, I have to register my totally human-powered kayak to, on state lands. <laughs> <laughs> and fish commission uh, uh, facilities. So just one consideration. The other one is, is I'm kind of a frequent user of Oil Creek, a multi-use trail, uh, do a lot of bike riding there, and have seen both. And if, as you said about, you know, all bikes versus just the e-bikes registering, things like that, and I think it would be very hard to draw a line in there anywhere, but uh, as I often see families with Little kids on, you know, with training wheels practically, I, you know, you don't register those? <laughs> Probably not, you know. So anyway, just some thoughts about that. It would, it, yeah, there, it, I could appreciate it would take a lot of thinking about just automatically doing it, so. Yeah. Any other questions for Nicole? Um, I just want to note that in the Q&A, uh, there was a question about how do you define, you might have answered this already, Nicole, how do you define an extended period of time on a motorized trail? Yeah, and again, I, I think it's really about educating the users on what the expectations are for a non-motorized uh, trail mm -hmm. um, and, you know, really encouraging uh, human power <coughs> pedaling. Yeah. And this was, was this on social media yesterday? That's so correct. I'm just curious, have you received a tremendous amount of comments, or how's the response been so far? Last I checked, over 540 comments. So oh my. people are interested. Okay. That was <laughs> and just more to come, I'm sure. <laughs> so certainly, if Conrad wants to develop comments, um, we would love to to, uh, to have them. And again, encourage the public to submit comments to that email address, which uh, we will uh, make sure you have on the website. And uh, thank you. Appreciate the time. Thank you very much, Nicole. Okay, next on our agenda, we have um, joining us today Heather 
Bollinger and Judy Dieter from the Bureau of State Parks to talk about and share with us the State Parks Concessionaire Program. So, thanks so much for coming today. Glad you're here. Good morning. It is an honor to share information with you regarding our concession program. It's one of the many programs of which State Parks um, oversees. My name is Judy Dieter, and I'm the Section Chief for Program Services that oversees um, most of the legal agreements. And good morning. I'm Heather Bollinger. I'm the Division Chief for our Park Operations and Maintenance Division for the Bureau of State Parks. Do we have a... Okay. okay. Thank you. So to define what a concession is, um, a concession is a, uh, an agreement with a fixed term um, with an operator that provides a service to the visitors of the state parks. Our agreements are normally either in five-year terms, uh, five plus five, which is five years plus a renewable five years, ten years. And then over 10 years, um, we have a statutory authority that someone would have to put in a capital investment that benefits the Bureau of $100,000 or more. So that gives you an idea of the scope of how long these agreements are. We don't have any that just continue to roll over. So um, they, they all have a term to them. Concession services uh, provide experiences and amenities for our visitors, so things that they wouldn't normally be able to do for themselves. Um, there are over 60 parks with concessions in them and uh, approximately 117 different locations. So uh, there's quite a bit of infrastructure when it comes to our concession program. The next three slides, we're going to go over the different types of concessions, um, and I'll just highlight the ones that, these are the ones that are most common and, and, and occurring. Bait vending is becoming more, uh, uh, more prevalent in our system. Disc golf and the places that we have uh, disc golf courses, uh, camp stores, firewood concessions, mobile food vending, bicycle rentals, Maple syrup sales we have in one location in north central Pennsylvania. Equestrian services we have in two locations in the southeast of Pennsylvania. Photography that occurs at Ohio Pow. <laughs> Parking facilities uh, occurs only in one location. We are only allowed to charge for parking in one state park, and that's Point State Park in Pittsburgh. We have tour boat concessions. We have one Wi-Fi concession in Prince Gallitzin State Park with the county. There is one Surrey concession in Presque Isle State Park. There's one cross-country ski concession in Laurel Mountain. There's an event coordinator, so special events coordinator at Ridley Creek State Park, and that is for use of the mansion for special events. We have a vending machine agreements, watercraft rental and marina services. Um, they can be everything from a small five uh, boat fleet to um, quite extensive, like we have in Marsh Creek. We have swimming pools where the uh, operators are responsible for not only maintaining the swimming pool, but staffing it, um, and those generally come with food concessions as well. There's uh, small watercraft rentals. Uh, we already talked about firewood. There's food and refreshment um, concessions as well. Those uh, range in, in size and scope from someone who's just selling ice cream cones and a couple bags of chips to people who are putting out entire meals. Whereas whitewater rafting, there are eight whitewater rafters, um, four in each location, one, in Le or one location being Lehigh Gorge and the other one Ohio Pow. There's downhill ski in four, con in four locations, uh, Big Pocono, Blue Knob, Laurel Mountain, and Denton Hill. And the golf locations, there are two in Evansburg and Caledonia. Um, those concessions are very polar opposite of one another. Evansburg is quite large and Caledonia is quite small. But those are the two golf concessions that we have. I'm going to just discuss a little bit about our high yield oper operations. So these are the locations that um, 
I think most people would describe as most successful in our concession program. Of the four ski concessions, the Big Pocono downhill ski um, does report um, some, some high yields. The other con uh, downhill ski concessions are, are smaller in nature, and I would just characterize them as struggling a little bit more. Um, we do have, of course, um, impacts with the changes of climate. Um, the natural snow making, uh, natural snow is less than it used to be, and um, there's anticipation that that's probably going to continue. Evansburg Golf is a long-term lease. Um, they uh, entered into some capital improvements, taking care of some bunkers and irrigation and a number of other large projects. Um, they, this, the newer operator who's in there is doing a very good business at that location, um, and pr probably largely due to its proximity to um, Philadelphia. Ridley Creek Special Events, um, this is the first time we have um, concessioned this type of activity. It used to be handled under a number of commercial use licenses with different um, caterers. And we found it was really quite difficult to manage, um, and the outcome for the people utilizing the mansion was not uh, satisfactory. So we've entered into an agreement with uh, one operator who manages all those special events. Um, they are controlled in such a way that the mansion is not overrun and is still available for other visitors to be there. Um, uh, so that is something, it's a new trial that we've been doing and I would characterize it as being beneficial to both the park and the operator. The Whitewater Outfitters are our high, are high yield um, operations as well. And when we talk about, a in a little bit, we'll talk about how things are paid. They pay per head, so the number of people that are on the river. The Marsh Creek Watercraft is one of our newer long-term agreements. Um, the operator there has put in um, a very significant investment of about $2 million into renovating the entire structure. It was a scab together building, you know, it kind of kept growing as, as the demand grew, um, and they are uh, uh, working on uh, com completing the replacement of that altogether. The Neshaminy Marina is our largest marina. It's most profitable down in Philadelphia. And um, that, that agreement has been in place now for, it's gotta be close to 30 years. Um, that same operator has been there for some time. What would, we, what would we consider small operations, which is actually the preponderance of um, the agreements that we have, these would be self-serve um, firewood concessions in our campgrounds where people go up and on the, on their honor, put uh, money into an Iron Ranger and take a pack of um, firewood with them. Remote location food concessions and watercraft, where um, we're really lucky to be able to find someone who's willing to provide a service. Um, most likely, it's, it's visitation doesn't demand uh, isn't demanded enough in order to pay people to be there. So we have a number of locations where the operators just love what they're doing and it provides a service for our visitors. And lastly, we have two binocular concessions that are very itty-bitty, um, and they're essentially the coin-operated um, viewing machines, and uh, they, they would be considered quite small. So how do we fill these, uh, these needs? We, when a park um, decides that there is a need, whether it's new or recurring, most of them are recurring um, services that we want to provide to the public, we tailor each agreement to that specific situation. Um, our parks are really quite different. The people that they serve vary, and, and the demands of those uh, concessions change from location to location. The contracts are drafted, and then they're placed out on this website for people to bid. They are competitively bid for the most part. And uh, whenever uh, someone goes to this website, they can actually sign up to be notified of um, concessions that'll become available. 
so there's an automatic notification as well. Generally speaking, um, to bid, a concession operator would be bidding an annual lump sum amount, um, and they would have to put down 10% of that with their bid. They uh, have to provide references, and they have to be current on their state taxes for, con or for contractor responsibility. The contracts themselves um, have changed an awful lot over the course of time. Um, the contracts that were 30 years old were probably about 10 pages long. Our contracts now are somewhere around 40 pages, depending on um, the amount of provisions that are in there. Um, they include a couple different sections. The premise and location is a description of uh, the place in which they're operating. The term limits, um, we spoke about just a little bit earlier about there being three standard terms, five years only, five plus five or 10 in length. Um, and those uh, uh, exceptions are the ones that have uh, large capital improvement. There is a section on the fees that are uh, remitted to the Commonwealth for the operations. These include the annual lump sum. Some of them are a per ticket uh, concession and some also add a percentage of gross receipts. Then there is the indemnification portion, the insurances that protect the interests of the taxpayers of Pennsylvania for the operations of these things on our land. There's the schedule of operations, which is the minimum amount of time that can be, that, that uh, they're expected to operate. There's recycling requirements that uh, Heather will talk about a little bit later. Um, they were alluded to earlier with the waste minimization. And then the special conditions are all the, the specifics to that operations. So it might be the minimum amount of um, uh, bikes that they have available for rent. It could be the, the watercraft specifications that are appropriate for that lake. Uh, in the equestrian one, it's, it's the matter of how many uh, trail rides and so forth they are required to give. Anything that gets down into the weeds there is in the special conditions. So how much business do they do? This is, you know, what people often find interesting. Um, the majority of our concessionaires, this is annual gross receipts, so this is before expenses, are only clearing in between ten dollars and $50,000 a year. So they're generally operating Memorial Day to Labor Day is, is the primary season, and that's the amount of annual gross receipts that they are um, uh, in general reporting. Some concessions, however, um, have as little as $1,500 annually. These are those super small concessions I was telling you about where we're just lucky there's somebody willing to provide those services um, and, and usually in our, our more rural areas. However, our largest concession uh, reports $3.5 million of annual gross receipts a year. Most uh, concessionaires claim that their profit is less than $25,000, um, so that would be after taking expenses away, and many of them also uh, uh, report claiming losses. Um, so that, that has been the trend for some time, uh, and uh, that would be all for that slide. So this uh, depiction here for the five-year revenue, um, I just want to show, you can see that the, the, the bars, for instance, are the annual gross receipts following the blue line. The gray line is CPI. So you can see it's basically taking track with the consumer price index, which means they're probably not making more money. They're collecting more money because the expenses of things are more but they're probably not making more money than, than what the consumer price index increases are. There is an exception. The 2020 year was the COVID year and we had a, a significant bump in visitation. And as such, the concessionaires who chose to operate generally did quite well. But you can see before COVID 17, 18, 19, it was a downward trend in the amount of annual gross receipts that, that they were bringing in. The concessions combined bring in about $2.5 million in revenue to the Commonwealth every year, 
And the revenue is generated again by the annual lump sums that are owed to the Commonwealth, as well as the percentage of annual gross receipts for those larger concessions. And um, those are identified down here in the bottom. The percentage of gross receipts, if the operation is less than $25,000 a year in value, we do not assess a percentage. Um, and then it's graduated from that point up depending on the size of their previous performance. So it kind of gives uh, an idea where we're collecting annual gross receipts on, on the more successful operations and supporting the smaller ones um, to have services for our visitors. Payment to the Bureau is only affected by those agreements with the percentage of gross receipts language. So the annual lump sum portion state very consistent across the, the board. So the annual gross receipts is where we see the difference in revenue. But again, you'll see it's really just following CPI at this point. Thanks. The recent changes to the concession program, um, as Judy said, new legal agreement forms, this is just standard. Um, legal procedure where we work with our Office of Chief Counsel to update the forms, and that gives us the ability to adjust for concessionaire needs as well as park needs. Child protection provisions, our concessionaires are required by law to file child protection pro provisions such as the background checks for employees <laughs> with contacts with children, uh, but as our new agreements have um, turned over and we're putting them out to bid, we're adding provisions just to highlight this requirement and draw it to the concessionaire's attention. Waste minimization. Uh, so this was something that starting 2020, I think the, the years are flying by. Uh, starting 2020, uh, we worked with the DCNR policy office to you know, figure out how we can introduce more waste minimization for our concessionaires. So this includes uh, materials to avoid, such as styrofoam, plastic carryout bags, plastic straws, and plastic cutlery. So basically our concessionaires uh, should not offer these in their concession. Reduction of items, uh, such as um, it, it's intended to allow our, the customers and the concessionaires to reduce items. So we recommend that they offer reusable cups, mugs, and cutlery for purchase. Um, we recommend that they buy in bulk to avoid waste of individual packaging, and I know during COVID, um, that was a challenge because everyone reverted back to all individual packaging because of, for sanitary reasons. So I think now we're hopefully easing back into that trend. Um, providing the condiments in self, um, you know, dispensed bulk instead of, you know, the little ketchup packets. Now you're, you're not producing any waste when you have it in a container where people can just access it. And then also um, things like, you know, limiting the number of napkins each customer may take. Maybe instead of having the dispenser sitting on the counter, you give them one napkin, you know, with their, you know, the hot dog that they buy. So things like that are what we're educating our concessionaires that hopefully they will adopt. Um, some of these we require in our agreement, so they will be adopting, but more of the, you know, the, the reduction strategies that I just mentioned. Uh, recycling, we specify in their lease whether they're required to recycle. Um, obviously, we would love it required at every single location, um, but recycling is a challenge for our remote parks. Um, we often have to pay um, fees, tipping fees for our recycling, so that is something that the park is committed to do, but sometimes it's not even offered in some locations. So that is something that we, um, again, hopefully can, can expand on. Um, composting, this is something that um, we're introducing. It. We're still trying to find a, a pilot, pilot location. Um, this one is a little bit more in depth than some of these minimization and, and reduction strategies. Um, but we're potentially looking at having our concessionaires divert waste from landfills and putting them into um, composting. And some of the items that they can buy are compostable items. Um, so just a few of the things that we're working on with our concessionaires. Trends in concession operations. So this especially impacts our, our smaller concessions. Our larger concessions seem to be able to sustain seven day a week operations, but this, uh, our, our smaller concessions 
really are um, reacting to the attendance. Obviously, most people work Monday through Friday. They're not, the parks aren't as busy where our holidays and weekends are highly attended um, days. So we are changing from seven day a week operate. Well, our concessionaires are, are changing and we're giving them the latitude in order to have a successful concession um, from a seven day a week operation to a weekend focused services. And this goes back to what Judy said about the minimum operations where before um, we might have bid out seven day a week operation and if we didn't get any takers, we might bid it back out again as a weekend only operation. Um, so again, trying to adjust to the, the trends that we're seeing. Um, also, as you know, we have either the changes in operators, whether they want to be more transient and come to our parks on the weekends, um, or we have some challenges with some of our infrastructure, but the movement from brick and mortar food concessions to mobile food trucks. I think there's a very successful one at the Kinsu Bridge, mm -hmm. where I don't think when they built it, they didn't really contemplate a, a concession area in the building, but there's a lot of people and they're hungry. And so we, we figured that that was a, um, the, the park found a, a mobile food vendor that comes in on the weekends. I believe there we provide, we pro provide electric so you don't have that in, um, carbon footprint of the generator. Um, so we are also, to that point, looking at our infrastructure, can we, in some places that we're doing this, if we're demolishing concession buildings, can we put an electric pedestal? That way the, the mobile food vendor can just hook into it and there's no need for generators or anything like that. Just to highlight some of our successes, and, and Judy touched on some of them, the Ridley Creek Special Events Coordinator, I think that's really, um, I think we can really claim that that is success. I, I don't think that any park manager, um, when they're going you know, for their park and recs degree, they took like a, a wedding elective. Um, so I think that, it, and really our, our goal is if something, if there is a need and we can't fulfill the role, whether it be just not our specialty like weddings, um, then, then we do want to see if we can leverage a partner. And in this case, we were able to, you know, put it out for bid because um, the goal is also to, you know, bring in revenue for the department. So we want to, um, you know, fairly offer it to anyone that, that is interested. Uh, so I, that I think, um, ha I think we can really say that that has been a success for the, the Bureau. And I think our operator is quite happy and is also looking at ways that um, they can potentially expand and that would be a you know improvement for the park that we would be beneficial of. Um, another success is the Nakamix and Pool transition from state park operations to concession. Um, we were not able to operate that pool last year uh, due to staffing issues. Um, the southeast is very difficult to hire lifeguards, unfortunately. So this year we were able to bring on a new concessionaire and they are currently operating and I don't, have you heard any feedback? I have not. Okay. I, I think they are, well, we haven't heard any bad feedback, so apparently they are happy. No news <laughs> is good news. Yeah. We have a couple watercraft concessionaires that have expanded, that have expanded their services and locations due to success. There's one in particular that we've noticed that are, is starting to bid on other parks, which is great. Um, we, you know, we, certainly love and support a, a, a successful concession operator. Um, I think another success that we're very proud of is our continued service to the park visitors during and after COVID-19 pandemic. So during 2020, when we were figuring out what the, you know, the shutdowns meant for state parks, what they meant for our concessionaires, um, you know, some concessionaires were impacted more than others. Our food concessionaires, as you probably know, you know, the restaurants were impacted um, where some like our watercraft concessionaires did so well. Um, so it, it really was an interesting to observe the different impacts um, where we, we were having so much increased visitation of seeing that success where other, other business sectors were seeing less success. And then some other uh, successes, um, so recent turnover and longtime concession operators that have given opportunities for a new look. So while it is a blessing to have a long-term op operator, there are some 
where it has been great to have a new operator, new ideas, and you know, breathe some new life into a concession. So while we've had successes, we also have had challenges. So small operators, often remote locations, uh, still remain to be a challenge. Um, I think Judy and I hold our breath every time we put out a you know, concession bid, just hoping we get someone to continue to offer services for our park visitors. Uh, they just generally aren't very lucrative, very profitable. Um, like Judy said, you, you often have a, an operator that's been there for a while or um, sees a need in the community and tries to step in and fill that. Uh, staffing challenges. Uh, sometimes our park staffing affects concession staff or concession operators, for example, pools. If our pool was closed, that would definitely affect the food concession that is attached. So even if a park runs a pool, we would not try to operate a food concession. So if we would have, um, I think, Cadoris, Little Buffalo, we, we run the pool, but then that food concession is right there in the pool complex. So any time that you know, we would have to, to, to close the pool due to maintenance repairs or the staffing challenges, that would affect our concessionaire. Um, inability to find performance guarantees. So we require performance guarantees on certain concessions. Um, they are more the high yield concessions or the high risk. high risk concessions, thank you. And that is to protect the Commonwealth against uh, any liabilities. For example, we have a concession operator, their annual rent is 20,000. They have a performance guarantee for 25,000. They skip out on their rents. We are then able to collect that performance guarantee, that performance bond, and recoup some of our, our liabilities, or else if we didn't require that, we'd be just be out that 20,000. Um, it is becoming more difficult, I think, as um, you know, the, the financial climate changes, um, they are harder and harder to get. So again, that is something that we will have to react to um, if there ever comes a time where people just aren't able to get them. Um, as we've mentioned before, movement from brick and mortar food and refreshment to mobile vending available only during peak times. Um, just a, a challenge because it's you know reacting to the infrastructure needs and also um, a change from you know the, the standards that we've always had at that park. Um, it, again, under the the, the uh, category of a, a blessing and a challenge, our large unique operators that are high expense so our camp stores, equestrian downhill skis. Um, even some of our, our pools, um, the, the, the ones that are employee intensive, operationally intensive, um, it, 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 is, it can be a struggle to change to um, economical, uh, diff or economic difficulties or trends. Uh, lifelong concessionaires retiring without attrition plans. So I mentioned that as a success, but also if you don't have someone to step in after them, that can be a uh, a, a challenge. We might have had a, a concession there for a very long time and it's no longer, no one bid on it and then you, you'll have you know, park visitors showing up and expecting a service that was there but is no longer there. And another challenge is infrastructure maintenance needs of park concession facilities. Um, you know, some of our, our, our Project 70 parks are, are aging, so just challenges with some of those infrastructure um, and, and maintenance needs that we have. And also, you know, adaptation to post-pandemic operations and current economic conditions. So what was maybe a high earning a concession like a pool, um, they're now struggling. Um, wages are different than before um, the pandemic and also higher cost of goods. So your chlorine might have cost this or your, your supplies for, you know, plates might have cost this, but now, it, you know, is it three times higher than before? So just some of the challenges that our operators face. And I don't have a slide for this, but I did want to cover um, next steps, future steps for the program. So we are in the process of starting to prepare a solicitation for a concession study for our program that will analyze our current concession program and then see what improvements that um, could be made for the program to make it um, you know, more profitable for the Bureau or um, could potentially be new um, new concession opportunities, and I'll hit on one that I forgot to mention, and um, it, or, you know, just what could we be doing better? 
is it just a process thing? Um, a new concession opportunity that I should have put in the success or potential successes column uh, is Tenter. Uh, so we are currently in talks with Tenter to operate at um, some specific sites in Marsh Creek State Park and French Creek State Park. Um, it is a higher level of Camping, I, though I, I, I've seen a, um, a uh, interview that they did, they don't like to be called glamping for whatever reason, I, I don't know, um, where we would actually have a concessionaire tenter um, manage those specific opportunities for us. So that's still in the development, but that is an exciting new opportunity that we're, we're looking at. And should it be successful, we will bring that into our concession portfolio and perhaps bid out opportunities at other locations. And then I think just questions for us. Yeah. Gary? Um, question, did you include uh, the uh, Hiawatha paddle boat as in your list because it's operated uh, totally with, uh, within the, or moored within the uh, Susquehanna State Park, Williamsport? It is not included in these numbers because it is a lease and not a concession. So it's a lease to the Chamber of Commerce or to whom? Uh, to the Hiawatha Incorporated. So that's a good point. Um, we, we could probably bore you with legal um, <laughs> descriptors all day, but things that we do not bid out to say we have a partnership like the Hiawatha, like our, um, our theaters that we have, like the PA Wild Center, the Elk County um, Research Bureau. Yes, thank you. Um, we don't consider them a concession because we don't bid it out. Okay. So we just have that partner that we um, execute that agreement with, and it's not competitively bid. Well, that that Hiawatha is very successful. Uh, we I just took our granddaughter on that uh, on uh, Sunday, and uh, it's a two-level paddle wheel boat, although it's motorized, but it has the simulated Power, paddle wheel, so it's got a historic character in it. They produce a program on uh, that a narrative that's uh, air or you know broadcast on, for the riders on the Hiawatha about the lumber era, and you see the booms along the Susquehanna where uh, they stored all the logs when Lum Waynesport was the lumber capital of the world from 1839 to 1889. So there's a lot of a history, a lot of really interesting information that's coming out of that, and they sell everything from beer and wine and food goodies. And so it's, it's a real neat enterprise, and it's wholly within the Susquehanna State Park. Um, the other question I had, uh, it had to do with the uh, uh, kayak rentals uh, and, and uh, boating rentals. So you are classifying that as a concession? Yeah, they, they would be covered under watercraft. Okay. Um, and stand-up paddle boards are actually making a big, um, I'm going to say a pun, a big splash. Um, they're, <laughs> they're, they're really um, picking up in popularity as well. So when we put watercraft rentals out, we put out what would be the minimum that we expect them to offer, and that will be based on the lake in which they're operating. Yeah. Um, and kayaks are, are pretty much... Uh, standard across the board, except at Shikalimi, where kayaks don't do very well um, due to the nature of the water impoundment. Well, it's not on a state park, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I, one of the things I volunteered for the Susquehanna Greenway Partnership is to be a steward of different river access points. And I was down on the West Branch, Susquehanna at Montgomery, and the campground there was jammed full because they were having uh, a, a, a river float outing. And I saw this big uh, can a trailer pulled by a heavy-duty pickup, but it said uh, Mad River. And I talked to the lady who was pulling it, and she said, 
she drove in from Colorado because there was such a strong demand to rent kayaks for a float trip on the Susquehanna. And other people brought their own kayaks, of course, but that that was kind of an interesting, different thing that I hadn't really thought about before. Bob? Thanks, Jerry. I've got a couple of questions and comments in the virtual world. Sure, Greg. Um, so sorry for not being here in person. Uh, first of all, uh, this is great information and very comprehensive, and thank you for it. Um, I have some specific things, but I think just sort of at the top level, I am sort of surprised at the total number, total amount of revenue at 2.5 million. Um, it strikes me as recognizing all of the factors that you uh, just mentioned. It still strikes me as a very small number. And I wonder if there's sort of from a strategic perspective, is there a goal around increasing that number? Is there a target number? Yeah. And is there a strategy around a big picture that you would then drill down to the various components to say, you know, by 2026, we want to get that number up to, we want to get that number up to 10 million or something like that. Um, that's kind of my first, my first question I'd make, like to follow up after that. So those are some of the things that we hope our concession study will answer. Um, I, I think our, our main focus um, is always the, the recreational op offering to our, our visitors. So um, while we hope we don't lose money, um, but certainly with that concession study, um, if we can expand that, that certainly would be a benefit to it. Well, I'll just put out there that I think uh, and I don't know if others on the, on the CONRAC would agree, but I think thinking about it as, from an organizational perspective, thinking about it as, you know, it would benefit our ability to provide more recreational services yeah. if we could generate over the next five years or reach a goal of over the next five years of, you know, achieving a $10 million revenue goal. I'm just making that number up. Maybe that's unrealistic. but. I don't know, I think that was the one thing that seemed to be missing in it, recognizing how much information and analysis you did do, but thinking forward toward what is the real opportunity here and how do we maximize that opportunity to generate revenue that supports the recreational um, the recreational activities. And I'll, I'll stop that point there because I don't want to, but I did want to say two other quick things. One, on special events, um, there's, uh, if, if there is an interest there, I'm just very happy to hear that that worked. I mean, those of us who have worked in nonprofit, you know, organizations in this space have been doing this forever uh, around uh, utilizing our physical plant for uh, special events. Um, my former uh, employer, Audubon, um, certainly had uh, done very, very well, um, you know, relatively speaking financially. Um, with uh, a, a wedding business, it takes a couple of years to establish, but there's uh, folks that I could assist with making connections if that were to become something uh, that would be of greater interest. And obviously not every location would benefit from that, but certain key locations, there's a lot of money to be made um, in that. And then um, on the point of the lifeguards and the pools, you know, down here in southeastern Pennsylvania, this is something that kills me because we have, you know, our pools don't open and yet we, do, so we have all of the related issues that everybody's aware of. And then there's no jobs for kids, but then kids don't know how to swim, so they can't become lifeguards and then the pools can't open. So it's a, you know, it's a very, very poor cycle. And I was just thinking about a connection between that issue and um, the or opportunity and the Student Conservation Association and that work that DCNR is involved in that Audubon also greatly benefited from down here 
where um, you know, we're thinking about creating uh, work opportunities for students over time by um, introducing them to work in and around these types of facilities. You know, an idea around sort of broadening that concept to address this would be a, you know, a way to uh, affect, you know, a couple of different problems simultaneously. So I'll stop there and thanks for the opportunity. And I'm also happy to, this is an area that I ha have thought a lot about and done some work and could make some connections. And I'd also be happy to follow up uh, separately if it would be at all helpful. Good. I think that would be great. Yep. So thank you for your comments, Greg, as always. Okay, anyone else with any? Bob, sorry. <laughs> uh, just it, it, in theory, it, let's just take a water uh, rental situation. We have the docks and obviously you have some type of, of land footprint that that operates in. It, who's responsible for maintenance and you know cutting the grass and weed whacking and repairing the docks? Is that the concessionaire generally or is that the park personnel? I'd say in most concessions, it is the concessionaire. However, in the very small operations or where the footprint, where it doesn't make sense, um, we take care of a lot of the maintenance. So it's very site specific. Okay, thank you. Meredith, just a quick question. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I think this is, a, as you know, is a very public facing part of the department's uh, umbrella of work. We've talked about waste minimization in the past as a council commenting on things. How can DCNR sort of set the example and, and encourage people to think differently when they're visiting a park? So I wanted to ask, have you thought about how to incentivize concessionaires to use different types of utensils and you know compostable plates or that kind of thing. Um, I, I don't know. If it, just thinking out loud, is it something like they get a they get to keep more of the revenue that they would otherwise be giving to DCNR, or maybe they're part of a green concessionaire certified by DCNR green concessionaire program and they get to advertise with a special seal on their. Uh, communication, something like that. So have you thought about ways to not just require that in a contract, but incentivize it financially? Um, I don't think that's something that we've contemplated yet, but it's certainly interesting. And I think we can add that to the concession study as far as to see if that's feasible to implement. Um, if, if we recognize that, you know, if we are putting these waste minimization uh, processes in you know, place that you know, a concessionaire may potentially bid less because they're putting out more money. You know, again, like I, I know the, um, the people in DCNR did extensive research as far as are the prices comparable because we did want to minimize the impact to our concessionaires. And I mean, we're certainly willing. You know, if it's their bid before was 500 and now it's 400 because they have to buy these certain products, we're fine with that. So, but I don't think we've we haven't contemplated yet like an actual like program that would incentivize. If I can add on to that, um, so as, as one of my duties, I'm co-chair of the sustainability team, which is an interdisciplinary team within DCNR, and, and we looked at these issues and, and worked with state parks on it. And we did, exactly like Heather said, and we did think about the cost, and we looked at the costs um, of, of using more sustainable products. And our first thinking was that we would give them a discount of some sort in their contract or potentially um, buy some of those products ourselves. But once we looked at the price, um, it's, it's not that much more expensive. It really isn't. Um, so our thinking was that we would not introduce it to all concessionaires at once, where we would have, we would, we would have some, some issues with the contract and contract amendments, is that as we do new contracts, we would include that in the contract so that they would include that, you know, minuscule cost increase into their uh, into their bid. Um, but the second thing about about having like a green concessionaires program, we have kicked that around and we're trying to define that because we we think it uh, it would be uh, in the long run kind of a sales pitch for the concessionaire. Yeah, that's a great point. I just have one question. When is the concession study 
uh, going to get underway, or do you have a date in mind, or is that still being discussed? So I, we're, the goal is to have it started underway this fiscal year. Okay. So um, it is a, always <laughs> difficult to juggle our priority needs, but this is high on my list of, of priorities, probably top 10. So um, yeah, the, the goal is to start writing and then hopefully have a contract in place um, by June 30th of, of next year. Okay, great. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Heather and Judy. We appreciate you joining us today and all that you shared. <laughs> thank you. All right. We have one more uh, presentation today, and that is with our Bureau of Forestry and their strategic plan. Uh, and joining us today is Ryan Fetch, who's going to share with us an update on how things are going. Ryan, is your mic on? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the strategic plan enco en encompasses that entire breadth of our, our work on both public and private lands. Um, it's seeking to help us meet the challenges of a, a changing environment in the Commonwealth and the region, uh, both the socioeconomic environment and the ecological and natural resource environment. Uh, we're using it to provide uh, focus on things that are kind of our core that continue to be important to us, but also to stimulate progress and drive growth areas. Uh, it, it serves a couple important functions kind of looking forward. One, it's going to be an important communication tool to groups like yours, but also to the general public about what our intentions are for our work in the future. And then it's also going to um, be part of an ongoing process. I guess we view the production of the plan itself just as uh, a milestone in our planning process, and it will be followed by work on implementation plans and alignment work for the Bureau to make sure we're set up to carry out the mission and the vision in the plan. Uh, next slide, please. We've gone through an extensive collaboration and input process to get us to the point where we are now. Uh, starting in 2017, we did Strength, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats, or SWAT workshops with all of our staff. We've done some extensive SurveyMonkey work uh, with Bureau of Forestry staff, DCNR staff, and um, stakeholders, which we had, uh, we advertised the stakeholder survey through about every means we could think of, Facebook, uh, mailing lists, uh, uh, to conservation volunteers, lease owners, gas operators, and we had 17,000 people take that survey, which we were pretty happy with. Um, we've also partnered with the Penn State Center for Survey Research, which is at their Middletown campus, on some public opinion polling, so that rather than um, something that's going out to like our friends or our known associates, this public opinion and polling is like a random sample of adult Pennsylvanians, and so it's like a statistically valid public opinion poll. And then they also did some focus groups and youth interviews for us. And then 2019, 2020, we did what we called our stakeholder roadshow and met with over 30 organizations, uh, giving presentations on where we were at with the strategic plan and trying to get their feedback on what was important to them. Next slide, please. So where we are now is that we have a full draft of the strategic plan developed. Uh, it's been through um, some, rev some review processes with senior leadership in the Bureau of Forestry and the senior leadership of the department. 
and it has uh, these core components. We call these the core, core components of the draft. A vision, which is um, new to the Bureau. The, the Bureau's old strategic plan, Penn's Woods, from 1995 didn't have a vision, so we have a vision now of our ideal future condition, where we're trying to go. A mission, which is a concise statement of what we will do to get there. And then really the bulk of the plan is a, a set of four goals and supporting strategies on how we're gonna go about achieving that mission and vision. And then a final piece is a list of guiding principles, which are sort of value statements, things that are overarching or cross strategy uh, ideas like collaboration. So, you know, whether we're managing state forest land or putting out forest fires or helping with forest health, we're, we're collaborating. So across all the strategies, collaboration is an important value to us. And there's eight or 10 of those. So next slide will give you a, a, a preview of, of what we've produced. So I'll read them for you, but the, the vision is a Pennsylvania of abundant, healthy, resilient trees, forests, and natural communities that enrich the lives of all people who contribute to their sound stewardship and recognize and value the life-sustaining benefits they provide. Um, just some, a few important things to point out to you are some of the nouns that we're using in the vision that you see also in the mission that were focused on trees, forests, and natural communities. So kind of that recognition that it's not just the large wild expanses of forests, but urban trees, urban forests. Um, and then our plant conservation work is important to us. That's something that's uh, or, uh, statutory responsibility of, of ours is wild plant conservation. And so working with those plants in natural communities, whether they be forests or not. Uh, the mission uh, to conserve, sustain, and enhance Pennsylvania's trees, forests, and natural communities while connecting people to our Commonwealth natural resources. You know, so three verbs there to start out, uh, that we conserve or keep forests as forests, that we sustain them is, uh, you know, a nod to our, our mandate in the Constitution, the Environmental Rights Amendment, that we're sustaining them for current and future generations. And then the word enhance, that we try to make them better. Um, and then a key addition here in the mission compared to our existing one is the, the social aspect of it, that connection to people. And we really heard strongly uh, fr from the stakeholder roadshow and from our internal feedback mechanisms that social aspects of our mission are becoming more and more important. And then the meat of the plan are the four goals uh, about ecosystems. Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's ecosystems are resilient in a changing climate. That's where you'll find strategies that, that cross that breadth of our public and private work, things like forest health, using native species, preserving biodiversity, uh, restoring watersheds. The second goal is about people. All people are connected with forest trees, or with trees, forests, and natural communities. Um, they're looking at better understanding the, the increasing diversity of the Commonwealth trying to create advocates and stewards to help us in our management um, and, and meeting people where they are, uh, doing work across the urban to rural continuum and doing work in every zip code of the Commonwealth. Uh, the benefits goal uh, is about the various economic, ecological services and benefits that forests and trees provide, how we can do a better job of measuring those, um, sustaining those, growing those benefits in the future and then a goal on state forest land management. Next slide, please. Uh, so as I mentioned in the future, the production of the plan is just once one milestone in the process. We will then work to develop actionable and adaptable implementation plans. Uh, we're doing some work with a management consultant that we retained on an organizational alignment to look at things like strategy, structure, staff, and the skills of those staff, and how they're aligned to help us meet the vision and mission of the strategic plan. And we recognize that building and enhancing partnerships and doing a, doing a better job of understanding the diverse populace of Pennsylvania is gonna be important moving forward. Next slide, please. Uh, and so next steps, uh, we're in the process right now of an internal, we're in an internal feedback process right now. We released the full draft internally two weeks ago, 
and hosted an all staff webinar last week. And in the month of August and September, we're gonna be hosting approximately 30 feedback workshops with each individual district and division of the Bureau and also providing them with surveys that they can fill out if they didn't speak up during the workshop or weren't able to make the workshop. Uh, that'll be followed by uh, external partner feedback and public comment period. Um, and then as I said, we're also kind of working in tandem on this organizational alignment as we finalize the draft of the plan, we'll be working with this consultant having some workshops with senior managers, frontline supervisors, and an all staff survey probably in the winter with that management consultant. Next slide, that's the conclusion of my presentation. Um, I can take questions if there's time. I know we're kind of short on time. Yeah. But as I said, this was just to give you a preview of where we are. We definitely intend to engage uh, more fully with the council um, as, as the draft continues to develop. And is there any uh, rough idea of when the external public comment period would be for outsiders, for outside the organization? I think it's, uh, we don't have a specific timeline in mind. It's likely to be towards the end of this year, but we're, we're trying to be respectful of what feedback we might get internally and, and not assume that we'll be able to very quickly incorporate that feedback and move on to the next stage. You know, if there's quite a lot of distress about some part of it, we want to take the time to address that internally first before we go into like a public comment period. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for Ryan? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, yes, Ryan. Yes, I did. Oh, sir. Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> uh, does your uh, state forest uh, plan address uh, the Pers the recurring persistent problem with spotted lanternflies and other uh, insect issues? It addresses uh, our, our role in keeping forests healthy and resilient and um, talks about the use of integ integrated pest management to, to deal with those. Uh, it doesn't go so far as to drill down to specific pests that we're targeting at this present time um, largely because it's meant to be a long-term, uh, probably 10, 20-year plan, and so those kind of specifics will be in the implementation plans that follow up. Uh, but, but certainly forest health issues and integrated pest management are discussed, yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or are we good? All right. Hearing none. Thank you very much, Ryan. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to table our work group reports. I don't think we had anything extremely pressing that we needed to get out today regarding that and would like to move to our second public comment period now at this time. Um, and I believe we have, I know we have some folks from the audience, but we also have, I think, a, uh, someone online, gentlemen, two people. So if we could start with that first, our first person that I'm aware of is Mr. Williams, again, who presented earlier this morning on the seaplanes, also has some comments that he'd like to share with us at this time. Are you still there, Don? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, I want to thank the uh, council. Oh, no. Oh, no. We're not hearing you right now, Don. <laughs> we lost you. I, I don't know if you can get back to where you were earlier where we could hear you. That worked. Still, we cannot mm -hmm. hear you. Well, you're breaking up for me, too. Uh, it might be a bandwidth problem. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Now, we can now hear, I can you, hear now. you better. Do you want to... Okay. Um, I'm a, a member of the Governor's Advisory Council on Hunting, Fishing, and Conservation as well. Uh, but my views are my own today and do not reflect the views of the Council. In general, I uh, appreciate uh, Nicole's presentation and I wholly support 
the DCNR uh, proposed policy. Uh, I think it's a very good one and well thought out. Uh, my only concern is the use of e-bikes by uh, disabled individuals under the American Disability Act. Uh, and the, those e-bikes was not uh, permitted on all outdoor off-road areas where non-disabled individuals can walk, including paved trails, unpaved approved trails, unapproved footpaths, and non-motorized uh, uh, trails, uh, regardless of type or class, if uh, the DCNR uh, regulates by type and class, which I don't think they're going to do. Um, so those are my only concerns. Uh, and again, I want to thank you uh, for the opportunity to present today. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And we also have copies of your uh, written statements that you made as well that we'll be reviewing as a council too. So thank you very much for that and your time today. Thank you. Okay. And I believe we also have a second person, uh, Bill, Bill Quinn. And I just have your name, Bill. I don't have any other information, but if you're still present. I am the, here. Okay, the floor is yours. Thank you. First off, I'd like to say, I think you guys do a great job in managing your parks. I, I had the pleasure to ride the Pine Creek Trail. Uh, I'm 70 years old. I just had my hip replaced and I had seen that uh, they had suggested class one bikes. And my point is the Bureau of Land Management on a federal level lets class one and class two bikes go. And also the bikes are not considered motorized because they're actually under one horsepower. But all that being said, the only difference between a class one and a class two bike is they're still restricted to 20 miles an hour. You still have pedal assist. The difference is class two has a throttle and class one doesn't. Now, in my age group and the people that I ride with, we need the throttle to just kind of launch ourselves. And then we pedal from that point on. And in all consideration, uh, the speed limit is like 15 miles an hour on the trails. And I think, you know, people who exceed that are just rude in general, but you don't have to be on an e-bike to exceed 15 miles an hour. I sometimes see people passing me on, you know, regular, regular bikes as well. Uh, just had the opportunity to ride the Pine Creek Trail, did the whole 61 miles. We spent three days up there uh, doing, you know, staying in hotels, eating at restaurants, and, you know, uh, adding to the economy of uh, Pennsylvania there. There's no way I could have done that without an e-bike. And, you know, and the people I ride with, and you see a lot of people who are buying e-bikes are 55 and older because they just can't do the, you know, the physical and be able to enjoy something like the Pine Creek Trail, maybe you can go five miles. Now I can go 20 miles. So I just wanted you to consider uh, class two in pretty much in the same category as class one, because the only difference is the throttle and you could disconnect the throttle on a class two bike and then make it a class one. So it seems kind of transparent that the two are very similar and the Bureau of Land Management on the federal level sees that. And I was thinking that the state of Pennsylvania might also want to recognize that. I ride the DNL trail, and I think uh, uh, that part of uh, where the Pine Creek Trail is, that part of Pennsylvania is just absolutely gorgeous. And want to go on more trails. Want to go out to the Allegheny and ride out there. Um, but I don't want to be restricted because I, I simply I just have a throttle on my on my bike to launch myself to get going because of physical um, kind of restrictions. Okay, well, thank you very much for your comments. And I would suggest too, um, if you don't have the information, if you would like to submit some things in writing to the department during this open public comment period, by all means, please do so. And if you need assistance in getting that information, let us know and we can send it to you to make sure you have that as well. well I have the uh, your email and I, I, I did send something, you know, an email out just kind of re reinforcing the point between class one and class, class two. Class one and class two. And I think honestly, if, you know, 
unfortunately, there is a lot of rude people out there, regardless of what you know mode of transportation they're using. You know, and and that you can't necessarily change by putting up a sign that says you know you can't come here. So, yeah, that's okay. a good point. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, and we appreciate your comments and um, appreciate your time with us today. Well, thank you so much. Have a good day. You too. Is that ever okay? And then we do have one gentleman in the two gentlemen in the audience today that would like to share their comments as well. And how about? <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah, if you just want to grab a chair where any of the. I'm going to be quick. Okay, you want to just you could sit right there in front of the microphone, just so people that are our participants yeah. can hear you who are not with us here. Yes, uh, my I only have uh, really a question. I don't expect an answer today, but uh, you know, the, I'm, I'm representing this, the Pennsylvania State Camp Association. So there's like 4,500 leased campsites in the state. Uh, you know various ways of generating revenue, of course, for, through the leases, but, you know, and, and revenue is a big, big topic and it should be, but I don't hear any discussion whatsoever here in this committee. I just wondered if it was appropriate for this committee to have some presentations or whatever in the future on that state camp leases. Okay. That's it. And what is your name? Chris Baker. Chris Baker. That's not my real name. But. That's the one you're giving me today, right? <laughs> All right, Chris Baker. <laughs> Stephen, but I don't use that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And uh, again, as I mentioned before with our comments, Council will certainly be reviewing all of the comments made today, and we will be following up the best way that we can. Thanks. Would you like to come forward to the microphone? Whichever microphone is closest to you there, just make sure that green button is on so everyone can hear you. All right. Uh, my name's Joe Metz. I, uh, I just saw this was happening and I wanted to make a quick public comment on the e-bike issue. Uh, I've been a mountain biker for 40 some years. I'm 67. Uh, I have a heart condition now. For the first 35 years, I uh, mountain biked just with pedals, just self-powered. I could no longer do that now. Now I ride an e-bike on the same trails and same roads in the state forest I always did, but it'd be impossible for me and for a lot of other of my contemporaries to do it without some assistance from an e-bike. And I just wanted to bring that, there's a whole cadre of people in my situation who uh, who fit that description. I, I don't go any faster or any I'm no harder on the trails than I was years back, but it's uh, that's my situation, and I think a lot of other people's too. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much for sharing. And I do again just encourage if you would like to, we have information that we can give to you if you would like to submit some comments and share them with your friends as well sure. um, during this comment period between now and the end of August. We would, the department would welcome that and should be nice. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe. Okay, are there any other comments? I think we have everybody taken care of there. Okay, um, I think that covers all of our information for today. Do council members have any other comments before we break for lunch and then go into our afternoon session, which again, we have a little bit of a full agenda, but um, we're doing good. <laughs> we'll get energized and get ready for, for the next round. Any other closing comments from anyone? Okay. All right. Thank you, those um, who virtually have joined us today. We greatly appreciate it. And Greg and Steve, who are on the line as well, council members, I'm hoping you can join us in the afternoon discussion. And our next meeting, as Gretchen mentioned, I believe is September 28th. Um, and we will again have it virtually and in person here at the Rachel Carson State Office Building. Jerry? I just want you to be aware that uh, I don't think I will have virtual access because we will be on a uh, Serengeti Africa safari. 
So you're not going to be joining us in September. Okay, we'll let that one go by, Jerry. <laughs> All right. So with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? So move. A second? Second. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Anyone opposed or are we okay with that? All right. Thank you very much, and everyone have a great day.